Welcome to another word in your ear and one with a DJ, broadcaster and columnist whose uh, memoir, his new memoir, uh, One Love, One Life, indicates that he has interviewed pretty much everybody on God's green earth, uh, with the possible exception of um, Gilbert O'Sullivan and Half Man, Half Biscuit. But then again, we probably missed those bits. It's Billy Sloan. Billy, lovely to see you. Good morning. It's very early in the morning for me, but I have, in fact, interviewed Gilbert O'Sullivan. He's a lovely man. I'm a big, big fan of his writing and his singing, so he's a great guy. Half Man, Half Biscuit is a box that I've still got to tick. Still got to tick. <laughs> so we're ticking, actually. Yeah. So we were just reminiscing about the fact that the, the last time we three were gathered... Uh, was, was when 1984, is that right? Tell the 19, story. 1984, you know, we, there was a BBC Two whistle test special called Rock Around the Clock, which started at three o'clock in the afternoon and went right through until three o'clock in the morning. And as you remember, it was a mix of live concerts, you know, classic videos, interview excerpts from the past programmes, and you two anchored it from the studio in Glasgow, and I was the... A roving reporter in the studio in London, rather, and I was the roving reporter in Glasgow, and I had to host two gigs, one by Aztec Camera at four o'clock in the afternoon, and one by The Cure at seven thirty in the evening. It was a memorable twelve-hour period. <laughs> and you were called upon to um, to provide something. So for you want mineral water is in the book, isn't it? it was, yeah, it's, about, it's five, about five minutes before the cure were due to take the stage, one of their entourage, I don't know if it was the tour manager or whoever it was, came to me and said, you know, we must have some bottles of mineral water for Robert Smith. He needs it for his throat. Now, this was 1984. I don't think Perry had arrived in Glasgow outside a couple of really trendy bars in the west end of the city. There was nothing like Malvern. There was nothing like Highland Spring. No mineral water at all. And I said to the guy, you know, the Barland Bar doesn't sell bottles of mineral water. You know, it, it must, it must. I says, it doesn't. He says, well, what about the pubs nearby? You know, the Barland is in a pretty rough part of town. And I said to him, I can take you to any one of these bars. I said, I can get you a bag of dope. I can get you a side of beef. I can get you a leather jacket. I can get you a Ford Capri, all at a knockdown price. But if the people in this part of Glasgow knew that you could make money from selling bottles of water, the River Clyde would be drained dry. So I don't, <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I don't know what happened. No, I don't know. Robert Smith never got his bottles of mineral water, but I can confirm that he was in fine voice from first song until last. So I don't quite. That was know. the side of beef that did that. It was yeah. the side of beef that yeah, did that. Yeah, I'm sure it was. And the so leather fantastic. jacket. That's so, Billy, you're in Glasgow still, aren't you? I mean, you yeah. the, the early part of the book is about uh, growing up in Glasgow. And it always interested me because uh, did you, uh, the whole kind of musical tradition of Glasgow, you know, <clears throat> Alex Harvey, Billy Connolly, you know, John Martin, Donovan, was that something you were constantly reminded of when you were growing up, all the people who came from there, mid yeah, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, kind of Glasgow was a kind of hard rock in town. Scotland was a kind of hard rock in place. So you were thinking about people like uh, Maggie Bell and Stone the Crows, Nazareth, you know, Jerry Rafferty, uh, you know, people along those lines, Alex Harvey, you know, that kind of stuff. I was just a wee bit too young for those guys. But, of course, when Alex Harvey came through, I saw him for the first time opening for Slade at the old Greens Playhouse in Glasgow. And he walked Fantastic. on stage. Fantastic. What a bill. He walked on stage and glared at the crowd, you know, and he, he was a bit older than your average rock yeah, star of the day. So he walked on stage, put his foot up in the monitor, and glared at the crowd, which was like a red rag to a bull, and three and a half thousand people simultaneously. There was this tsunami of abuse that came from the upper circle, the circle in the stalls, heading towards the stage, and they were shouting, oh, get you, man, shouting and screaming. They hated him, absolutely hated him. Yeah. And he just let it calm for a split second, and he looked at the crowd and said, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I would like to introduce you to my little band, the Sensational Alex Harvey band and somebody somewhere pressed the button that went do 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 and that was the start of the faith healer and Zal Clemenson came on you know with the green you know Piero uh, you know clown outfit in the white face Chris Glenn came on with the big blue leather jock strap you know Hugh McKenna came on with the fedora hat and the kind of smoking jacket and Ted McKenna slipped behind the drum kit they get booed on stage and went down such a storm that they could have got an encore Slade had to in fact Noddy Holder still talks about it to this day. Slade had to, in fact, delay going on by about 30 minutes just to let it calm down a little bit. And the next day, I went up to Listen Records in Cambridge Street and I bought the next album, 
simply because of the picture of Alex Harvey in the back of the sleeve, and I've been a fan ever since. They were my favourite band. But I was lucky because, you know, when I was coming through in journalism at the end of the 70s and the start of the 1980s, you know, it was it coincided with this real kind of explosion of music in Scotland. You had the Associates, the Skids, Simple Minds, Orange Juice, Aztec Camera, Joseph K, Altered Images. You know, they were all coming through at the same time as I, I was coming through. And we were all learning in the job. You know, we didn't know what we were doing, really, but everybody was learning in the job, whether it was Jim Kerr of Simple Minds or Claire Grogan of Altered Images or me. You know, so it was a really exciting period, you know. You know, in the early 80s, we sat in the office one day and we kind of counted all the bands who had either released an album on a major label, an indie label, a self-finance record, and we got to something like 50 different bands and we gave up counting. I mean, it seemed that if you walked down Buchanan Street in Glasgow with a guitar case, some enterprising A&R man would jump out of a shop doorway with a checkbook and say, hey, kid, you know, sign here, I'll make you a star. You look like Edwin Collins, you'll do. Yeah, you, yeah. you'll do. You've got, you know, you've got a floppy fringe and you wear a pair of desert boots, you know, you, I'm going to make you a star. But it was, yeah. really, it was really exciting because, you know, it was all new territory for me and for the band's concerned. So it was a fantastic period to be involved in the music industry. Why did you want to become a writer then? I mean, was it to... to Wanted to meet some of your heroes, there's clearly an element of that in the book, no, wanted it, it, to evangelise about music. No, what happened, Mark, was that uh, in the 21st of October 1971, I went to my first ever gig, which was The Who at Green's Playhouse on The Who's Next Tour. Now, I had to beg, and I mean beg my old man about two months previously to let me queue out in Sucky Hall Street, which is the busy shopping street in Glasgow, a bit like our version of Oxford Street, I guess. And I had to queue out overnight with my mates from six o'clock in the Saturday evening right through until nine o'clock in the morning really? to, buy, to buy tickets from an electrical store. For some bizarre reason, Green's Playhouse, which was it primarily a cinema, yeah. did, not, did not have a dedicated box office. So the tickets, and I've never found out why, were sold from a place called House of Clydesdale at 160 Sucky Hall Street. So you walked into the shop past vacuum cleaners, fridges, you know, washing machines, hair dryers, and sitting in the back shop were two women sitting at a little trestle table, like those tables that you would get if you were eating tasting, wall, <laughs> tasting wallpaper. Yeah, they had their sandwiches and a little flask of, flask of tea and stuff, and you bought two tickets. So I bought a ticket to go and see The Who for 85 pence on the 21st of October, 1971, and it was a life-changing moment, you know. There so, was, so, sorry, go back to this. It's cash money, was it? You turned up with cash. Yeah, yeah. You, you could, you could. Now, at that time, Sucky Hall Street was still a busy traffic. Yeah, you yeah. know, it wasn't a pedestrian precinct, so it was quite an edgy, dangerous place to be at two o'clock in the morning when the pubs and the clubs were coming out. And, and how, how old? How old clean. were you? How I was, old were you? I was, I was fifteen. I was fifteen. So my mole man, you know, was really reluctant to let me do it. But when I went to see the Who on the night. You know, on that famous 15-foot-high Greens Playhouse stage, there was Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend and John Entwistle and Keith Moon. Now, up until that point, they had just been guys who I'd seen in, in, in pictures. You know, I would cut pictures out of New Musical Express or Melody Maker, and I would pin them up onto my wall. But, you know, in that night, I have never felt excitement like it. And on the spot, I decided I was going to get into the music business. Now, I'd love to have been a swivel-hipped rock star like uh, <laughs> you know Robert Plant or Roger Daltrey but I kind of was realistic enough to know that I didn't have the musical talent so I thought I would get in through a more journalistic route and that's basically what happened right right where did you first start who did you first start writing for I first started writing I, I, I wrote a, I wrote a letter to my the editor of my local newspaper which was called the Bishop Briggs and Springburn Times and I said look I will do a pop column for you a weekly pop column for you for free if you put by Billy Sloan, if you give me a byline on it. My, now, my thinking was that if I amassed enough published articles and I went for a proper job in a newspaper, I could show the guy who was interviewing me, you know, a portfolio of published work. And it just by sheer luck happened that she was, uh, that the editor was a lovely lady called Nina Young. And she was actually looking for a reporter to cover the Springburn area, which was quite a tough kind of working class area in the north of the city where I lived. And I was working in a building site at the time and I was making about 70 quid a week, which was a lot of money. My mates mm -hmm. were on about 30, 40 quid a week. But I was making 70 quid a week because I had, uh, you know, loads of overtime and double time at weekends and treble time on a Sunday and that kind of thing. And she offered me the job and it was £19 a week. 
which was less than a third of you know what I was what I was earning, and I just had to bite the bullet. I had a couple of hundred quid in savings, you know, at my back, but that was all. And I just bit the bullet, and I went from seventy quid to uh, you know nineteen quid a week. Uh, when you got into the nineteen quid, it came in a little brown envelope. And wait, you wait, get... did, did you see through the holes? So you no, the holes the the on the front. Yeah. And Aye, you could and, and, see and, the actual notes. And, and, you the, didn't, and you, you, if you waved you it around, you could see the, 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 the loose change. And there was a bit on the corner where the corner of the notes stuck out. Remember yes. that? Yeah, yes, you could, yeah. And, and when you opened it, you got the whole £19 because, uh, you know, you didn't get any, you know, uh, national insurance or any tax deductions. You got the whole £19 because it was under some kind of threshold. And that's how it started. I started in local papers and then I went to work for a, a Radio Clyde magazine called Clyde Guide and suddenly I was interviewing... Iggy Pop and Eurythmics and who was the first Collins, person you interviewed? Can you remember? I'm sure you can. We never <laughs> the, forget. The first really big person I interviewed was I, I then got a job doing the column for the Sunday Mail, which was like the equivalent of the Sunday Mirror in Scotland. And it, I mean, it sold nearly a million copies every Sunday. And the very first big interview I remember, I remember it vividly, was that Chrysalis Records flew me all expenses paid to Hamburg in Germany, <laughs> and I had to interview Rory Gallagher, you know, who was like a huge guitar icon and a guitar Very legend exciting. and uh you know coming face to face with rory gallagher was the first kind of face to face uh big interview i did and, and that was a magic moment because you know the guy if you were making a list of the 50 or 20 uh, 50, 20 or 50 greatest guitar players in the world he would definitely be on that list so he he was one of the first I think the first big interview that I did face to face. It was a real so, thrill. So we, the the first trip overseas I ever did was to Hamburg, also to see to see the Little River Band. Yeah. Did you end up on the Reaper Barn in the middle yeah, the, of the night? The, ne the next day, the, the roadies and the guys in the band took me to uh, the Reaper Band. You know, as they call it, the Sinful Mile. And what an eye opener that was! You know, it was full of you know brothels and strip clubs, and but it was a bigger deal for me because it was you know the the site of the of the the, the famous you know top ten club and the Indra Club and yeah. uh, all the all the places that the Beatles had played. So you know, walking around there was like nothing I'd ever seen before in Glasgow or London. So it was quite an eye opener. It was a fantastic experience. So if you get a job as the kind of the the music writer on one of the one of the big Scottish papers back in the day, yeah, you're a really important guy, weren't you, for the for the London based um, PR community, a record company, yeah, because, because if somebody if somebody was playing Glasgow, Scotland, they had to talk to Scottish media. Go on, yeah, I mean, I I, I got, you know I did the column for the Sunday Mail from 1979 to 1983. Now the Sunday Mail in those days sold nine hundred thousand. Uh, copies, you know, so they, they calculated that, you know, for every paper sold, 3.5 people read it, you know, a guy get, gets the paper, his wife reads it, his son reads it, maybe another family member. Yeah. So you were reaching something like 3 million people in a population of, you know, just over 5 million. So it was quite a, a big spread of, of audience. And then in 1983, I applied for a job in the Daily Record, which was the daily equivalent of the Sunday Mail, just exactly like the Scottish version of the Daily Mirror. And I just applied for a, a job as a features writer. But the editor was a great guy called Bernie Vickers, a man CUNY, and he was really well respected in newspaper circles. And he decided that he was going to employ, for the first time ever in Scotland, a dedicated music writer. Now, what was happening in Fleet Street was actually beneficial for me because a few months previously, The Sun had launched a column called Bizarre, yeah, yeah. which still runs to this day. And it was a guy called yeah. John John Blake John who Blake. fronted that, right? And he was he was great. So, of course, all the record companies and the publicists and the PRs kind of gravitated towards him, you know, <coughs> backstage gossip and, and uh, you know, say stories about upcoming album releases and gigs and stuff. And then in a period of months, every newspaper in Fleet Street seemed to have a dedicated music writer. So you had Rick Sky in the Mirror, you had Baz Bamming Boy in the uh, the Daily Mail, you had Leslie Ann Jones in the Mail on Sunday, you had... Um, uh, what was his name? Jeff Baker for the Star, oh, cool. and you had, of course, the Jeff evergreen Baker, Paul McCartney's man, yeah. the uh, evergreen David Wigg, You know the legendary oh, David yeah, Wigg for the Daily Express. <laughs> so you know the the fact that you know all these papers. What had dedicated see, what do you think was caused that? Because I always had a theory that it was either Culture Club or Live Aid or the combination of the two that made all those newspapers realise the commercial 
uh, value of covering pop music regularly. Would you I, think it was I, something or one person or an event that, that, that brought that? I, I, th- I think the old, older guys who ran Fleet Street, who were all kind of middle aged guys, suddenly realised that young people bought newspapers. And what, what were young people interested in? And they were interested in football, which was already covered. They were interviewed in fashion, which was covered to an extent. But they were also interview- interested in music. You know, they were record buyers, they were gig goers. And that's why they, they started doing it. Now, now, when I started in the Daily Record, it was very romantic. It was the 14th of February, 1983, oh, yeah. Valentine's Day. And I was viewed with suspicion by some of the old timers on the back bench because, you know, while the paper had a medical correspondent, a political correspondent, a football correspondent, a showbiz correspondent, a, a, a women's issues correspondent, you know, an industrial correspondent, they didn't have a music correspondent. So some guy, some young guy like me, who was writing about, you know, people who had long hair and played guitars was viewed with real suspicion. But Bernie kind of had real faith in me. And right from the start, he billed me as Scotland's number one pop writer. There was a bit of pressure, right? Six editions a week, Monday to Saturday, Scotland's number one pop writer. It would have been more accurate if we would have put Scotland's only pop writer yeah. because none of the other <laughs> yeah, papers right. had yeah. anybody doing this. Yeah. And, you know, I suddenly went from, you know, writing maybe one or two stories a week for the Sunday Mail to suddenly doing the musical equivalent of spinning plates, you know, and I was working yeah. in four, five, six stories a week. And in this first early days of the of the Daily Record, I remember vividly interviewing Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart down at the church in, I think it's Crouch End Crouch in North End, London, yes. yeah. down there. I interviewed Edwin Collins, who was signed, the Orange Juice was signed to Polydor, and the first album was was just about to come out. I interviewed the guys from Spandau Ballet, who I got to know really well, Gary Kemp, Martin Kemp, you know, say Steve um, Steve Norman, John Keeble, and uh, Tony Hadley. So it was a real exciting time. And then the first big, you know, London job I did was on um, March of 1983, uh, thanks to my good friend, who I'm sure you know, Bernard Doherty. Right. I went to a press conference at Claridge's for David Bowie, who was announcing his Let's Dance album and also the Serious Moonlight Tour. And that that's where the, the, the cover of the book comes from. The yeah, picture yeah. on the cover of the yeah. book is your roving reporter with his little cannon sure shot up in the corner trying to get a picture of David Bowie. But that was the first time I saw the pack of hyenas yeah. that are known as the London Music Press Corps, you know, who were like elbowing each other at the way and shouting and screaming, trying to get a, a, a good vantage point. I'd never seen anything like that before in my life. So... It was all very exciting. It was, it was great Dave, fun. Dave and I both obviously came through the the music papers, which is a completely different environment, really, yeah. because you were you know it was about criticism, it was about evaluating evaluation rather yeah. of, of of whether anything was any good. But mostly, you were you were required to write positively, weren't you, about pretty much everybody? Yeah, it I wasn't mean, really. You never picked anyone a subject who you were then going to. Uh, you know, crucify. It was all very promotional, wasn't it? It, it? it did happen, though. I mean, I remember, you know, I see in the book, you know, there's a whole chapter in the book called um, I Don't Want to Talk About It, which is about the art of doing an interview. Because, you know, as you guys know, you've done it longer than me. Even you know, you don't just turn up with 20 questions and fire them off, you know, machine gun style one after the other. There's a bit of a skill involved to it. And, and the worst interview I ever did was, was Chuck Berry. I I spent three months fixing up an interview with Chuck Berry, and I think it was 1985 or something like that. And he was just the most horrible, nasty, rude, obstructive old guy I'd ever met. And I, and I didn't do anything to upset him. I was very polite and reverential towards him, but he just treated me like dirt for... Did you put that in the piece? Yeah, I wrote a piece, you know, because we were... This was in... This sounds really romantic, but Bernie, the editor of the Daily Record, we were holding the front page literally holding the front page because Chuck Berry hadn't appeared in Scotland for something like 10 years. And Bernie says, right, we're going to go big in this one. I'm holding the front page. I want a great picture of Chuck Berry for page one. And then we turn to page four and five and there'll be a two page spread with your interview. So we were literally holding the front page. Now in those days, this was pre-digital cameras. So I took the photographer down, you know, with his camera and he hired a motorbike the Oh yeah, but just biked back to the office. To, yeah. to, to, to bike the films back to the office through the rush hour traffic because it was half five was the, the time for the interview and we were cutting it really fine because deadline was something like half seven. So we were going to take pictures of Chuck Berry first and then I was going to do the quick 10, 15 minute interview. So when, we, when Chuck Berry arrived, he looked at the photographer who was surrounded by his cameras and his films and his flash guns and his lenses and he went, who's he? And I went, that's a photographer. No photographs. 
And I went, why is that? I'm not dressed yet. And I said, but Chuck, you look amazing. And he did look amazing. He looked exactly like Chuck Berry, you know, the oil back hair. And he had the lovely shirt, you know, with the boot lace tie with a sort of silver clip, you know, fastening it. He had the buckskin waistcoat, the tight faded jeans, the, the you know, the Cuban heel books. I said, you look fantastic. And he says, no, you don't understand. And he pointed to his head. He says, I'm not dressed up here yet. So, of course, when we get back to the office, we never had one line of quotes from the interview. I think the first question I asked him was, "How you must be delighted to be back in Scotland. You know, how does it feel to be back in Glasgow? That's a tough, just, challenging question. <laughs> just, to get, just to get the ball rolling. And he went, I said, how does it feel to be back in Glasgow? And he went, I don't know. I just got here. That was probably his most expansive answer. <laughs> and then at the very end, end of it, the fan, because this book's very much written from the point of view of a fan, the fan came out in me and I had a great black and white picture of him, you know, doing the duck walk with his guitar across the stage and I asked him to sign it and he kind of grudgingly autographed it and then threw the pen down in my lap. And I always regretted that because it has since been my aim to profit in some way from Chuck Berry. And if you look up eBay at the moment, uh, you know, a Chuck Berry signed photograph, you could get 250, 300 quid. I don't even have the enthusiasm to fish it out of the filing cabinet and list it and photograph it and sell it on eBay. I can't even be bothered. So we get back to the office and Bernie says, right, what have you got? What have you got? And I went, we've got nothing. And I quickly told him the, the story. Right, write it like that. So I sat down and wrote it how horrible Chuck Berry had been. And about three or four days later, I got a, a fax. Remember that? You remember you said yeah, that? Yeah. From some guy who was like the sort of organiser of the Chuck Berry Appreciation Society in uh, the UK saying, how dare I, you know, uh, you know, uh, have a go at the king of rock and roll. You know, this is absolutely ridiculous. You don't know what you're talking about. So I sent him quite a lengthy fax back, tell him exactly what had happened. And he went, yeah, OK, I know he can be a bit difficult. Because a couple of years later, he was appearing at the Apollo in Glasgow. And I got friendly with the guy, Frank Lynch, sadly he died about a month ago, who opened the Apollo in 1973. And there was a time, I think it was in 75 or something, when Chuck Berry was playing the Glasgow Apollo and his fee was 25 grand and he refused to go on stage unless he got the 25 grand in cash before he Dollars. went on stage. So, of course, Frank Lynch was panicking. And probably he, went off at exactly the time the allocated exactly, time. Because I've, se I've seen him and he left halfway through a number. He played guitar and he would look at his watch and just stop the number. So Frank Lynch then had to send all of his staff because Frank Lynch ran a company called Unicorn Leisure. He was also the manager of Billy Connolly. And Frank Lynch was the guy who famously got Billy Connolly on the Parkinson show and begged him not to tell the bum joke with the bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, Which we all remember. Changed yeah. his fortune. But Frank Lynch had to send all his staff around his other outlets. There was the, the Electric Gardens, there was the Muscular Arms Bar, there was the Ultra Tech, all these clubs, and get whatever cash they had in the safe. And they brought all the cash back, counted 25 grand, put it in a carrier bag and handed it to Chuck. And, uh, you know, he, he finally went, grudgingly went on stage, but he was refusing unless he got his money in cash. Well, at least, he didn't, ask, at least he didn't ask for Perrier water as well. Yeah, that's, that, yeah. that was good. That would have been a deal breaker. So what's, the, working on Scottish media, uh, you know, what's the what's the, the ultimate kind of Scottish music story that, that in, a, a Scottish editor would think, that's the one, that's what we want? Is it, you've got the story in here about Rod Stewart and... Um, oh, yeah. And, 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 Michelle uh, and Michelle Yes, and, yes. And, and, is it Monet or Moan or whatever? Moan, 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 Moan. Michelle Moan. Tell, yeah. tell us that story. It's a sort of revenge thing right. on his part, Mi 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 Michelle Moan had a very successful lingerie company called Ultimo. And each year she would hire some, you know, famous female figure like a model or a, a a pop star to be the face of Ultimo for that particular year. And one year she decided to hire Penny Lancaster, who at that time was Rod Stewart's girlfriend. She wasn't married to him because he was still technically married to Alana Stewart. They hadn't got divorced. So she hired Michelle, she hired um, Rachel Hunter. Sorry, I'm getting Penny Lancaster. She hired Penny Lancaster to be the face of Ultimo for a year. And, you know, Rod Stewart came up to Glasgow and they had a big launch night at the Armadillo in Glasgow and, you know, it was the hottest ticket in town and they posed for pictures and did interviews and stuff like that. And after a year, she decided to sack Penny Lancaster and she hired uh, Rachel Hunter, who was Rod's then estranged but uh, current wife. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, that's a little bit naughty, you know, but if... 
it's business, business is business. Now, if she if she just done that and hired her, and that would have been that, there would have been no problem at all. But of course, she had a sort of press launch, and she can't keep her mouth shut. So when she went to the press launch, you know, she was asked, you know, why she hired uh, um, Rachel Hunter, and she says, "Well, I always wanted Rachel Hunter, but a year ago I just couldn't afford her fee." So I hired Penny Lancaster because she was the cheaper option. So, of course, that went down like a lead balloon, as you can imagine. And then she was asked by some enterprising journal what the difference was between, um, you know, uh, Rachel Hunter and Penny Lancaster. And she says, well, you know, Rachel Hunter's like a Brazilian World Cup star, but Penny Lancaster's like somebody who plays for Falkirk, who were one of the lower... Oh, that's you know, low. That, so I'm sitting in the office one day. I remember it was a Wednesday. And a lady that you two know very well who still works with Rod called Moira Bellis. Yeah. Who works at NBC with Barbara Sharon. Moira Bellis phoned me up in, in the, about one o'clock that day. She says, Billy, uh, what are you doing at half past six tonight? Now, there's only one answer to that question. Now, where, would you, where, where are you going to be at half past six tonight? And I said, where would you like me to be, Moira? And she says, I'd like you to be at the end of the phone. Rod wants to call you uh, from Beverly Hills. I says, what's that about? She went, Michelle Moan. So at half six on the dot, Rod Stewart calls me up and we have a cut, bit of chit-chat because I think Celtic were playing that night and he was going down to some Scottish pub in Santa Monica with his mates and they were going to have a few beers and watch the Celtic game. But then he said, Bill, Bill, can, 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 I, can I phone you back from another line? I'll phone you back in two minutes and he put the phone down. Now, I think what he did was he moved to another part of the house in Beverly Hills where Penny couldn't hear what he was going to say so he could get a bit more privacy. He phoned me back and basically you know, tore Michelle Moan apart. I mean, he said that, you know, when he was, uh, when she got offered, the, when Penny got offered the job, you know, the money, he didn't say what the money was, but it was about 200 grand. He says the money was not the going rate for the job. And he had asked some of his business contacts, of which he's got many in Scotland, you know, what they thought. And they all told him not to touch Michelle Moan with a barge pole. She was troubled. But of course, he didn't want to sort of be the, the you know, the big uh, party pooper where Penny was concerned. You know, she was trying to be independent, not live off Rod's coattails, wanted to earn her own money. So he kind of decided he was going to support her. And he basically just for 20 minutes ripped Michelle Moan apart. She's a manipulative bitch. I hope she chokes on her profits. And then at one point I said to him, what did you think of the football analogy? And he went, what football analogy? Oh, said, well, that's oh, going to make it more... <laughs> I said when it's she said, help. I said when she said that uh, Rachel was like a Brazilian World Cup star, but Penny was like some bloke who played for Falkirk, and he just went quiet. And, you know, who does she f and think she is? You know, she's a manipulative bitch. I hope she chokes on her. And then he said this. He said, uh, "My Penny has not got a single bad bone in her body and in her entire body, but Michelle Moan's entire skeleton reeks of self-interest." Now that's not a quote you make up over the top of your off the top of your head. He'd been thinking about that and stewing yeah. about that for weeks, and that was our headline. So what we did was in the Sunday Mail, um, we 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 ran a kind of spoof story, an alternative story on page one and page four and five for the first edition, and then after the first edition rolled off the presses about you know midnight or whatever it was. We then changed it to Rod's Revenge, and uh, you know that was so that the other papers, like the News of the World and the Mail on Sunday, and and you know the Sunday Times couldn't steal the story. You know they couldn't catch it by that time. And, so, uh, and then and then the the the, the, the postscript for that was the BBC, uh, BBC Two, I think it was, uh, did a, a a series called "You Can't Fire Me, I'm Famous." which was fronted by a then largely unknown Piers Morgan, believe it or not. Right. And they did all these stories about celebrities who'd get fired, like, you know, the time, uh, you know, Naomi Campbell had thrown a mobile phone at her personal assistant and, mm. and all that kind of stuff. And number one in the series was uh, Penny Lancaster, Rachel Hunter and Michelle Moan and Rod. And, uh, you know, they came up to the office and filmed me with the paper and I was on, you know, the Lorraine Kelly show in the morning and I was also on the earlier morning show with Eamon Holmes. And, I mean, it, it made headlines. It was one Brilliant. of the biggest no, stories. Your, it's your job just to keep stirring, it's, isn't it? Yeah. Like that. It's the perfect story, that. It's, it, it is. You know, it's got Ron Stewart. It's got... It's got two, two not, beautiful not, supermodels. Two, two supermodels. It's got a lingerie it's, firm. It's got a controversial Scottish businesswoman. <laughs> It's, and it's got underwear. You know, and there, was, yeah. there, was a, there was a great line right at the end where Rod said, uh, and, and remember, you know, tell her that uh, 
I prefer the lingerie in Victoria's Secret. I don't like the Ultimo stuff. Make sure you put that in. Now, in this entire 20-minute interview, you know, with him, he never raised his voice once. He never shouted and screamed. He was just talking in the same way that I'm talking to you at the moment. And at the very end of 20 minutes, he said, so then, Bill, have you got, do you think you've got enough? Do you think you've got enough? And I went, ever so slightly. I think yes, we're, we're, we're slightly, okay. Yeah, yeah, we're, slightly we're better than... Better than Chuck Berry. It was one of the biggest stories I ever worked on. It was a page one story, and it kind of it was followed up in every local radio program. In the it's morning. a brilliant it was story on the telly. And I loved it. Another one I thought was terrific was that you interviewing Grace Jones, who I think was in a bath, right? He's so in the bath. Well, yeah, how, I, did, how did that come about? I got. I, I didn't interview her once before at a place called Blake's Hotel down there in Kensington, mm. which I'm sure you both know. And she was very yeah. intimidating. You know, she was she was nice. She was great, and she answered all the questions. But you were always aware that you know you were one duff question away from getting a right hook like Russell, Russell Hartley had got. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she was she was very intimidating as you can imagine. And then a, a couple of years later I got offered an interview with her with again with a lovely guy that you'll know called Murray Chalmers. Oh, yeah. uh, from Dundee who runs a very successful PR company to this day and looks after Radiohead and Kylie Minogue yeah. and Noel Gallic and Robbie Williams, right? And he was looking after Grace and he said, let's go to Milan and we'll interview, you can interview Grace Jones. So I was a wee bit reluctant because my nerves had still been shredded from our previous meeting. So we go to Milan and we arrive there on the Saturday to be told that on the Friday night, Grace had gone out with her entourage to a party and she came back about half six in the morning, taking the phone off the hook, put the do not disturb sign on the door and uh, you know just decided she was not under any circumstances to be disturbed or to be bothered. So Murray and I go out in Milan, which was a lovely place that I'd never been to before. We did a bit of sightseeing. We went for lunch. We did a bit of shopping. We came back. We went for dinner. Went to bed on Saturday night. We'd never spoke to anybody in the Grace Jones entourage. Got up on the Sunday morning, had breakfast, went out sightseeing again, went for lunch. And much as I like my grub, there's only so many plates of pasta you can eat. So we got to like six o'clock on the Sunday night and reluctantly we just had to throw in the towel, you know, because we were flying back to Heathrow later that night so we called the taxi it was a complete waste of time we put our bags in the boot of the taxi and money was paying the bill at the at the reception desk and the phone went and I saw the guy saying Mr Chalmers that's for you and he handed the phone over to Murray and I had just heard Murray going what now <laughs> hang on a minute so he put his hand over the phone and he says that was Gracie's guy she'll do the interview now what do you want to do and I said well Christ you know we're going to the airport, you know, you get a flight back to, to Heathrow at nine o'clock. So I said to the cab driver, I said, how, how long realistically have we got before we need to be off and running? And he said, well, it's a Sunday night, the traffic won't be too heavy, but we would need to be off and running in 20 minutes, 20 minutes tops. And, um, you know, I said, right, let's go and do something. I'd rather do something than do nothing. I don't want to go back empty handed. So we were taken up to this suite in the 10th floor or something. And we walked in and it was absolute carnage. You know, there was all these sort of amazing looking female supermodels lying about in brand pants and various stages of undress. Small lying lingerie. In the, lying lying yeah, in the floor, the theme, lying, yeah. lying in the floor, lying in the sofa, lying in the bed. And there was all these beautiful looking guys that looked as if they'd just stepped out of the pages of old lying, lying, lying about in various stages of undress as well. On the floor, there were room service trays with half-eaten meals in it, bits of melon, you know, that with the middle scooped out, empty bottles of shot. It was chaos. You can actually so see that in the photograph in your book. There was a bowl on perched on the bath. Yes, with half that's a melon right. With a it, half yeah. a melon in it, right. And, and and I did a kind of cinematic pan of the room and I didn't see Grace. And this security guy beckoned me to come over to the bathroom door and he said, uh, she's in the bath. If you want to interview her, she's having a bath. And I kept waiting for the punchline. And there wasn't a punchline. He said, you're going to need to interview her in the bath. So I walked into the, uh, the bathroom and there she was lying in all her glory, covered in soap suds to cover her modesty. And I had 20 minutes, I just had to steam in. So I sat down on the toilet pan, I put my tape machine in the B day, I pressed play and record, and interviewed Grace Jones for 20 minutes in the bath. Now, soap suds and bubbles are made of soap suds are made of bubbles and they dissolve. So after about five minutes, they dissolved and she was lying there and all her naked glory. So there was lots of eye contact. You know, I was trying not to look down, but there was lots of eye contact. <laughs> and at the very end of it, I thought, you know, people are not going to believe this. So I said to you, can I get a picture? And I expected the security guy to haul me out by the, you know, the scruff of the neck. But I, I sat down on the floor of the bathroom. She leant out the bath and covered in soap suds and gave me a hug, right? 
and I and, and, and I walked out the room and I said, Murray, I said, have I just interviewed Grace Jones in the bath? And he, he, he kind of nodded and went, yeah. So about three or four weeks later, I was out at a gig one Saturday night and my, my late father, God rest him, he phoned me and went, you've, you've just been mentioned on TV, you've just been mentioned on TV. And I went, what are you talking about? And in ITV in those days, Dame Edna Everidge had a late night chat show on ITV at like half ten at night. And in this particular edition, our guests were, wait for it, Tony Curtis, the Hollywood movie actor and yeah. legend, and Grace Jones. And Grace Jones mentioned this incident in the in, in, in the interview with Dame Edna. Now, I never saw it, and it was in the days before, you know, iPlayer and Watch Again facility, so I, and I never knew anybody who taped the show. So I never saw it. So lo and behold, about a year ago, 2022, there's a great programme on Sky Arts called From the Vaults with Guy Garvey, the guy from Elbow. And he goes into the ITV archive, which has got the biggest film archive in the UK of sport and politics and news and music and show business. And he does this great programme where it's all vintage clips of like, you know, the Sex Pistols on the Tony Wilson show in Manchester and the first ever U2 appearance on some pop show in Newcastle. And, you know, clips that have been seen once and have never been seen at all. And I'm sitting, and he does it year by year, and he did 1989, so I'm sitting watching it, and it's Sonic Youth and the Pixies and all that kind of stuff. And suddenly a clip of Grace Jones came on, on the Dame Edna show. And I can't do the Australian accent, but Dame said, and I believe, you know, yeah, you know, you like to do a lot of, uh, you know, interviews in the in, in your birthday suit. And, of course, Grace Jones says, yeah, I did it recently. I did it recently. The guy just turned up when I was in the bath. You know, she made it as if <laughs> she was having a bath, and I just... And he just turned up when I was in the bath and, you know, and he was very nervous and, you know, and, but, you know, I relaxed and I made him relax and Grace Jones and, and, and Dame Edna, one of the greatest ad libs I've ever heard. She says, you know, I relaxed and I, I made him relax. And, and Dame Edna went, I bet you were pleased to see that, dear. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it was brilliant. And, and, and I saw, you know, I saw the clip for the first time. And when I was interviewing Guy Garvey, I told him, I said, I was the guy, and he remembered it. He says, I'm going to try when we do the repeats to do a little ticker tape along the bottom like they do in Sky News, saying that, you know, uh, you were that guy, Billy Sloan. But, you know, after that, every journalist wanted to interview her in the bath, but she never ever did. But Murray, yeah. Murray, used, to, Murray used to go to a hotel, you know, when he worked at Parlophone, and he would. He told me that he would go up to a room in a hotel that you have, you know, quite a serious meeting about budgets for, you know, promo budgets for for videos and her schedule coming up and interviews and that stuff. And she was sitting have a 90 minute meeting completely bollock naked. And that was just, that was just the way she did it. You know, so interviewing Grace Jones in the bath was one of those, you know, pinch me, you know, is it really happening moments, but I've got a uh, photograph and, and later I went down the interview in Birmingham and I took the photograph down and she wrote on it, splish splash. I was taking a bath. <laughs> and you I, were there, you were there, there. and really? that story is among among many others in Billy's book One Love One Life Stories from the Stars which is out now 